So on to the uh, last medal category um, for the evening, and so this is the Marsden Medal, and so awarded for a lifetime of outstanding service to the cause or profession of science in recognition of service rendered to the cause or profession of science in the widest connotation of the phrase. And so, um, spoiler alert, there's actually two medals being awarded this year. Um, you know, so there's independence of judges, right? We can't control the judges. And so they came back and said, well, there, there are two people that are equally amazing. We cannot pick. And we said, well, pick one. Um, this is uh, Heidi and I, not just me. And they said, no, they're both equally uh, uh, outstanding and amazing and worthy of recognition. And so for this year, I don't think it happens very often we're awarding two medals for the Marsden. And so <clears throat> um, the first is uh, John Montgomery. Um, the University, Professor John Montgomery, University of Auckland, and the second is Professor Warren Tate, University of Otago, and they're not in any order. Um, and so I'll read out John's citation first, and then perhaps John, you could say some words, and then and then Warren. Um, so uh, Professor John Montgomery from the University of Auckland has made an outstanding and wide-ranging contribution to science. His research ranges from marine science to brain research with key research themes including Antarctic fish biology, flow sensing in fish, bioacoustics, shark sensory biology, and cerebellar evolution. Thanks. Um, Professor Montgomery's strong contribution to the international research environment can be recognized through numerous high profile publications, including papers in Nature and Science and a recent book on cerebellar evolution, as well as numerous national and international honors. The strength of his wider service to science is evident in his commitment to postgraduate supervision and mentorship, as well as to public outreach and engagement. For instance, he was the director of the Lee Marine Lab for 12 years, and he played a major role in engaging with the public with marine science and <coughs> garnering philanthropic support for the redevelopment of the laboratory. He is also integrally involved in the establishment of the Institute of Marine Science at the University of Auckland, and he was the inaugural director. Moreover, he has contributed to many other service roles and he has been a board director of both NIWA and Antarctica New Zealand. So congratulations, John. The floor is yours. I didn't put any slides together. Um, I've just got a few words just to echo some of the sentiments that we've uh, actually heard. Um, already, and uh, just to kind of expand a little bit on um, on the citation there, um, I just sort of want to start by thanking the presidents, the co-presidents, Craig and Heidi, and uh, the association. And um, you know, it's a real privilege, um, uh, humbled by the, the presentation of the medal. Um, so I've actually uh, really enjoyed today uh, being part of the conference, and um, I would just like to endorse what the society is doing um, in terms of um, the conference today, partnerships, societal resilience and opportunities. Um, really important topics and really important conversations for us to have. And I, and I think both as scientists and as institutions, we need to strengthen those connections. And I think the society is, is kind of working at the, at the front of that. And uh, I really endorse that. Um, so just in terms of kind of the, it's interesting the way the pathways develop, I, I, I went through school on limited biology, um, I was kind of heading down the track towards doing engineering um, here, and, uh, and then I had a kind of 20 minute conversation with John Morton who was the professor of zoology at, uh, here, and I'd, I'd spent a kind of a childhood growing up on shore with sailing and swimming and, and that kind of stuff, and he kind of talked me into, into marine biology. So I, I came here, started here. Um, Went to Otago, have to say, I kind of struggled with undergraduate biology um, some. And uh, kind of the lights came on for me at a second year um, at Otago when there was a visit from a guy called Eric Denton, who was the head of the Plymouth Marine Laboratory. And he, he was a physicist who shifted into biology, and I kind of saw that kind of connection. And uh, sufficiently to get me motivated to go through into postgraduate work and apply for a Commonwealth Scholarship and work with Eric um, at the Plymouth Marine Lab. So I kind of started out in that area, came back to, uh, to the job here in 78. Um, there was quite a big Antarctic program here, and I've, I've really kind of had the privilege and luxury of being a kind of academic scientist. I'm an innately curious, I just kind of love um, problems and uh, working towards solutions, and 
the time in the Antarctic was kind of a bit like um, Darwin's um, kind of finches on Galapagos. I mean, a whole marine ecosystem there that had evolved in the last 20 years of fish in different um, niches and got interested in, in the kind of flow sensing side of things and how they got through the winter down there. Um, kind of came back and kind of extended that into electrosense and sharks and uh, worked up at, um, at the Marine Lab um, in San Diego, uh, Scripps there, uh, with some of the people who had actually discovered electrosense. And one of the things, the common um, aspects of those two systems is that the sensory systems are just dominated by the animal's own movement. So you imagine you've got flow sensors all over the surface of the body or electrosense, and every time you move in a fluid environment or you create or modify the electric fields that we all create, then those systems get barraged by that. And we figured out that um, that problem is solved in the brain by basically an adaptive filter which cancels anything associated with what the animal is doing itself. So these adaptive filters then um, are basically like really um, smart noise cancelling headphones that uh, fish and sharks have in the brain. So that was kind of where we got into, into that side of stuff, and I'll come back to that with Sarah Bellman in a sec. Um, and then we've gone and done a lot of other stuff, a lot of marine bioacoustics work, um, which has some really interesting kind of ecological implications. And then more recently, kind of I've got back into the cerebellum evolution side of things, where our cerebellum actually evolved from the structure of shark brains, essentially. And uh, it turns out that our cerebellum is 80% um, of the neurons in the brain of the cerebellum. And it's basically just a massive array of adaptive filters that gets it kind of pushed into and co-opted for all sorts of different activities, a lot to do with, with motor control side of things. So that's where the, the cerebellic connection comes in. Um, and then I think what's been kind of really interesting for me is having kind of started out on that engineering track, I've sort of, um, in the last little while, um, got back into collaborations with um, the engineering, with the Bioengineering Institute, um, and the international group that I work with, Neurothology, has gone really into that zone of biomimetics, looking at what we can learn from biology in terms of new technology and side of things, and I'm really excited about that. And to be fair, it's kind of more so on the other side of the world than here. If you go to the Neurothology meetings in Europe, kind of over 50% of the papers there are being presented by people who are looking at that biomimetics and developing new kind of technologies based on insect flight and um, animal sensing and all those sorts of things here. Whereas in, in the Southern Hemisphere, it's still kind of more biologically oriented, but I think that's kind of an indication of the way things are going. So I just want to, uh, to close by um, acknowledging, uh, again, getting back to the theme of the conference, partners um, and partnerships was the first theme for this morning's um, session. And uh, as others have said, um, you know, the partnerships um, that I would acknowledge um, through my colleagues and through my collaborators, both kind of locally and internationally, and also through my graduate students. I've been just a huge part of, uh, of my career. Um, resilience, I think, was the second theme, and I'm not talking about societal um, resilience here, I'm talking about family resilience and the way in which my family have put up with me kind of over this career. <coughs> And then finally, in, in terms of um, opportunity, I would like to hope that out of uh, the work that I've done, um, there is a kind of legacy of opportunities, both for my graduate students that are working um, in different places and different areas um, that are as diverse as um, uh, aerospace engineering at Bristol University, looking at uh, biomimetic um, drone flight, basically, uh, principles of dealing with turbulence and those sorts of things, to some of my graduates who are working in the medical field now, looking at hearing um, and, uh, and aspects of that which have therapeutic value through the kind of cerebellar stuff, uh, again, which I think has significant um, thera therapeutic opportunities through the sort of the ecology stuff that we've done. And one of the things that I've uh, got involved in, I kind of stepped down into a sort of phased retirement a few months ago, um, and put my hand up to be um, science advisor for the GIF Foundation um, here, which is looking at um, restoring um, ecological health in the Gulf. So that's kind of pushed me much more into the domain of the sorts of things we were talking about today, and I found some of those conversations today really useful. So just thank you again. Thank you.